Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here at Google today, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing our story with you and answering some questions. I'm especially proud to have Ellie and Coach with me today. We've been on a book tour for, for months now, uh, but Ellie has the challenge of being a junior in high school, so getting her out and having her be a part of this is a special, special day for us. Um, so I want to begin by just sharing some of the numbers, uh, because often when you hear about diabetes, what you're hearing about are the staggering numbers you can see on the screen. Uh, and we often forget what the numbers mean in terms of the human price that is paid for people living with the chronic disease. So you've heard that the rates of diabetes in America are on the rise, likely. And you've often heard that the cost of caring for long-term chronic disease is you know, risk, risks bankrupting our health care system. But what Ellie, Coach, and I are here to talk about today is the personal price that chronic disease can play. And we're here to share uh, the unlikely way we have found to cope with the challenges of living with a chronic disease. I want to begin by giving you some background about me, because it'll help inform uh, our story and, and help you understand what managing a type 1 uh, diabetes reality meant for a type A mom. Uh, so this photo was taken shortly after I graduated from a master's program at Harvard. I got to the point at, at, my, uh, at the end of my time at Harvard where I was so pregnant with our fourth son, William, who's the baby in the photo, uh, that I couldn't fit behind the desk and had to sit sideways. Uh, and literally the day before, uh, the day after I finished my, my last final and completed the program, William was born. And I graduated three weeks later. Uh, and so I, I use this picture as an example of uh, my, my delusional state that if I was willing to work hard and pay attention to detail and plan incessantly, that I could make it all work, that I could make work work and school work and manage four children under the age of eight at this point in time. And I was able to hold on to that illusion and delusion uh, for a while, actually. About uh, 11 months later, uh, we, as a family, went up north to the White Mountains at, over Thanksgiving weekend. And Ellie had just turned eight about two months before this photo was taken. And around August of that year, so a few months before Thanksgiving, we noticed that she wasn't herself. She seemed agitated, moody at times. We couldn't quite put our finger on what was wrong, but she wasn't her enthusiastic, optimistic self. And I knew it was too soon for the dreaded puberty years, right? She was only just eight. There were some things happening at school with the transition of a teacher, and so I worried maybe that was affecting her. We couldn't quite put our finger on it until we were away together as a family over Thanksgiving, and her symptoms became so acute that they were no longer uh, something we could brush under the rug or, or treat as if uh, maybe this was just something that she was coping with emotionally. Uh, so at this point, we were we just celebrated Thanksgiving with our extended family, and we had headed up with the six of us. And the first thing I noticed was that after ice cream for dessert one night, she was ex uh, especially thirsty, couldn't quench her thirst, drinking all the time. And that night, we were in a, a small hotel room, and I heard her get up multiple times to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which also struck me as odd. And then the next day, there, there was a, an indoor pool in the hotel where we were staying, and she put her bathing suit on. And the bathing suit that had fit her just fine over the summer was now too big, which it's not supposed to go that way. It's supposed to go the other way. And I thought, oh, there's, so there's something wrong. Uh, and as you can see here, you know, her coloring was not good. She had dark circles under her eyes. And I, uh, I remember distinctly walking down the stairs of the lob to the lobby of this hotel, because this was before smartphones, and Googling uh, the signs and symptoms of diabetes. And my brother-in-law, my husband's younger brother, uh, lives with type 1 diabetes, but he was diagnosed as an adult. And my husband and I were together when he was diagnosed. And I remembered vaguely what symptoms he had described. And so I started Googling the signs and symptoms on the only computer that was in the hotel lobby uh, to see if I could come up with some explanation that would make me feel better about what I was seeing uh, in Ellie. Unfortunately, she had every symptom. She was excessively thirsty. She was going to the bathroom frequently. She was irritable. She, seemed, she had lost weight, clearly. She seemed uh, ir agitated. And I said, well, you know, let's 
let's just give it another day because then the next day she would wake up in the morning and seem okay. Um, and it wasn't until later this weekend on our way home we stopped to get a Christmas tree and she asked if she could have some hot chocolate. And she had some hot chocolate and couldn't make it to the bathroom in time before having an accident. Uh, and that's when I knew something was really wrong. So the very next morning we were in her pediatrician's office and unfortunately her pediatrician was not there. I begged the physician assistant to do what was a simple urinalysis in the office, just you know, a urine test. And he, was, he did not know us, uh, we had never seen him before. And he was dismissive, I would say, uh, kindly, and said, well, you know, I think she's probably just constipated. She, she can't possibly have type 1 diabetes. I, I think we're, let's just give it another couple of days and see how she does. And, you know, you, you have this moment when you're, when, you're, um, when you're raised by two advocates. My mom is a U.S. senator. My dad was a judge and a lawyer while I was growing up. I learned how to advocate for myself and for my children. And you always have these moments where you think, am I just being too pushy? Maybe I'm being too neurotic, maybe I'm being too type A, maybe I shouldn't insist. But there was just something that said, I, we, we just have to rule this out. And so I said, well, I know it's just a simple urine test, please just do the test. And with, he, he, he left the office and said, fine, we'll do the test if it'll make you feel better. And within five minutes, he had come back into the office with his head down and said, it's conclusive, she has type 1 diabetes, you have to go to Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, by the time we got to the emergency room at Boston Children's Hospital, the doctor who attended uh, and treated Ellie said, if we had gone home that night and she had woken up and had a normal breakfast, she would have ended up in a diabetic coma and would have been medevaced uh, to Boston Children's instead of us taking her there the night before. So that really changed our life. That was a point at which I learned very hard and fast that even when you work hard and even when you are willing to uh, put as much elbow grease as you can muster into whatever it is you're tackling, life can throw you hurdles that you just can't possibly anticipate. And I have to say that at that moment, I wasn't entirely convinced that this was going to be all that hard. You know, you don't really know what you're facing until you live with it. And so for those of you who don't know, um, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, it means that Ellie's body does not produce any insulin. And in this photo, she's actually showing her insulin pump to Michael J. Fox uh, at an event uh, where they were both advocating for stem cell research. Type 1 diabetes means that you're constantly chasing healthy blood sugar uh, ranges because your body's no longer producing insulin, you have to take it in a synthetic form, either in a shot or in an insulin pump. And you're constantly making decisions about how much insulin your body needs because your pancreas isn't working. Uh, so this, this means, in Ellie's case, that she tests her blood sugar by pricking her finger eight to 10 times a day to make sure her blood sugar is in a healthy range. It means every time she puts anything in her mouth, she has to take either a shot or tell the pump that she needs insulin. It means that everything affects her day-to-day -day safety and well-being, so exercise, stress, being ready to take an exam at school can shoot her blood sugar high. Uh, being a, playing outside in the cold can drop her blood sugar low. And low blood sugars cause seizures, which can ultimately lead to death. And high blood sugars over extended periods of time can cause very complicating factors and organ damage. Uh, so getting this right for a type A mom became my singular focus. And Fortunately, I have this incredible inspiration in the form of my oldest daughter, Ellie, uh, and she was willing to jump in with both feet. You know, there was this moment at Boston Children's Hospital where it was 2.30 in the morning. We had, it took us uh, over 18 hours to actually be admitted and given a room. So for that 12 hours, we were in a tiny emergency room room where she was lying on a cot and there was no other chair in, this, in the room. Uh, and it was 2.30 in the morning, we had finally gotten a room, and I felt myself slipping into that place of despair where you start to self-pity and feel like, why me? And why did, we have to, why did this have to be us? And then I saw Ellie you know, lying in this bed, feeling 100 times better because she finally had insulin, the insulin she needed that had been making her sick for so long. 
And I thought, well, I don't have the luxury of going there. I, there's no room for despair. We got to figure out how to, how to live with diabetes and, and help Ellie live her best life with diabetes. And that's really, for me, where the journey began. And, and I followed her lead from diagnosis at, to we sit here today. And I use this picture because she, from the very moment of her diagnosis, wanted to live out loud with diabetes. She wanted to tell people about it. She refused to be defined by it. And she was willing to try anything to, to deal with it. Um, so this was only about eight months after diagnosis. She was already trying an insulin pump. She, uh, along with Michael J. Fox and lots of other folks, were advocating for the stem cell research that we so desperately need to ultimately cure the disease. Uh, and that work actually led her to the White House, where she got to uh, be, she was one of the only children in the room when President Obama signed the executive order that allows for stem cell research. Fast forward eight years, and that stem cell research is at work right here at Harvard, uh, and is on, the, really, the researchers at Harvard are on the precipice of ultimately curing type 1 diabetes as a result of stem cell research. And I am 100% confident we're going to see that in her lifetime. Uh, but I, we followed her lead as uh, she dove into medical research. So within 28 days of her diagnosis, she was uh, testing a drug therapy at Yale New Haven Hospital, where she was in the hospital for a month going through this process of testing this uh, new medication over the course of two years. And she was the first pediatric patient at Mass General Hospital to try the bionic pancreas, which is what you see here. She's actually wearing uh, four continuous glucose monitors that they were testing across her stomach. And the IV pole she's attached to has all the algorithms and the intellectual engine that is making the decision for how much insulin her body needed. Uh, so while she was in the hospital for four days in order to test this, today, you know, just three years later, it is now the size of your smartphone, and it's being tested at diabetes camps uh, in Massachusetts. And FDA is saying that by 2017, we're likely to see uh, an, an approval for the bionic pancreas, or a version of it. And so again, we you know, followed her lead. The challenge is that with type 1 diabetes, it doesn't get easy. It doesn't get any easier. So even though she was willing to try these drug trials, and she was trying the insulin pump, and she was trying uh, the bionic pancreas every day, pricking her finger 8 to 10 times a day, having to count carbohydrate in everything she puts in her mouth. She doesn't have the latitude of walking into the cafeteria that we just walked through, picking up something to eat and just eating it. It's, it's a five-step process. What am I going to eat? How much carbohydrates in what I'm going to eat? Am I, am I coupling it with any protein that will slow the burn in my body? How much insulin do I already have working in my system? What's my blood sugar right now? All before she can take a bite of anything. So while she was 100% committed to making life better, the reality was that day to day, this was a constant challenge. Um, and one of the ways we found together to cope with the challenge was to stay invested and involved. And so that's really what led us to this unlikely uh, hero, hero in our family, Coach. We ended up co-chairing the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation Children's Congress, which is uh, an advocacy event every two years in Washington. And it brings 150 young people from across the country to DC to share with new members of Congress and current members of Congress what it's like to live with type 1 diabetes. And we agreed to co-chair this particular year because one of the things that we had discovered when Ellie tested the bionic pancreas was that the regulatory environment for approving these devices was so unclear that industry was saying they were no longer going to be investing in the advancements with the bionic pancreas because the roadmap for approval was, was very gray. And so this particular Congress was dedicated to advocating with the FDA um, and, and other agencies in Washington to, to create a regulatory pathway that industry could see that would ultimately ensure if all these boxes were checked, we could get to a place where the bionic pancreas could be approved. And again, I, you know, I say this because one of the challenges is you live with risk every day, right? I mean, as a, at, we're here at Google. I mean, you, Google knows risk. You have to take risk in order to be successful. And when you put an insulin pump on and it continues to pump insulin even when you have a low blood sugar, that's a, list, that's a risk we're living with. Uh, and it's a risk in many cases you're willing to take because it means you don't have to take 12 shots of insulin a day. 
Uh, so Ellie right now is wearing an insulin pump. You can't see it. It's wireless. But it's going to continue to pump insulin in her body even if she doesn't need it because it doesn't know. And so the bionic pancreas brings all this intellectual power uh, and it helps it understand, well, if the blood sugar is dropping, I'm going to shut the pump off. Fighting the FDA to help them understand that this is how the technology can work was a big challenge. And it's what led us to want to co-chair the Children's Congress. And it was at this Children's Congress that we saw a dog, a, a golden retriever, who was supporting a little girl at the time. I think she was about eight. She was younger than Ellie at the time. And there were 150 children in the well of um, the Senate hearing room, and then another 200 proud parents walk, watching. And I sat and watched this dog sit up and circle his person multiple times and try to find the parents of the young, young girl and then sit back down because he couldn't find them to make eye contact. And then two minutes later, he'd get back up and he'd circle her again until he could finally get their attention. And they came over and tested her. And sure enough, she had a low blood sugar. And we had heard about these dogs because as chairs, we got to see the applicants who wanted to come to Children's Congress. And several of them had talked about diabetes alert dogs. And you know, I'm, I've got my Harvard degree, and I think, it's impossible. I, you know, I'm type A. I'm, I'm working so hard to, to manage every day and help keep Ellie healthy, and I can't figure it out. And we've been into all these trials. How on earth is a dog going to make this work? So I went into this event very skeptical. I didn't think that there was any way this really worked. But if it provided some comfort, then that was a good thing. And then I saw firsthand this dog alert his person. And she had a low blood sugar, and the parents helped her treat it. And we went on about the hearing. And so I couldn't so easily just push it aside. We, got, we went home from this Congress on a high, feeling optimistic that the FDA was going to create a roadmap and that someday, very soon, Ellie would have the bionic pancreas. But we were also living with the reality that every day was still so hard. And at this stage, Ellie was entering puberty. And when she was first diagnosed, you saw those photos, she was four feet, five inches. And now she's five feet, eight and a half inches. And all of that growing affects diabetes management. So puberty and hormones, insulin is a hormone. It's also hormone resistant. So when you're growing from four and a half feet to five, and five feet, eight inches, and you're becoming a young woman, that means your insulin demands are being tripled in some instances. And, and that roller coaster we were right in the middle of. And yet we knew from having been Washington that the reality of getting a bionic pancreas was years away. And we needed some more hope. We needed something else to look forward to. And so I started digging and I started learning about diabetes alert dogs. And this is Coach. Uh, Coach is Ellie's diabetes alert dog. We are incredibly lucky to have him. What I discovered when we first started going through the application process is that the industry that that trains and provides service dogs is not very well regulated. And so I was finding everything from the dogs cost $10,000 to you have to raise $25,000 to get a dog to the dog can do anything you want it to. It can bring you your slippers and it can inject your insulin. I mean, it got to the point where I thought there's just this is not going to work. And then we found CARES. CARES is an organization that's based in Kansas. They keep the cost of their service dogs very low because they partner with a correctional facility in Kansas. And actually, since we've written the book, they've extended to two new correctional facilities. And they work with inmates who meet certain criteria. And they train those inmates to do all the basic training for the dogs. And all that savings that they realize by not having um, trainers outside of the correctional facility doing the training gets passed along to families. So, when I started looking at this, I thought, OK, well, that seems fantastic. What a great program. It's a, an opportunity for uh, people in the correctional system to get, a work, you know, get on the path to work study. It's an opportunity for families like ours to have a, an animal that is much more affordable. And uh, it just seemed for the first time like maybe we could give this a try. They also, it was very interesting, CARES also said they so believe in their training that they would uh, take the dog back if you got the dog at home and it just didn't fit or didn't work in your life, uh, if it didn't work. And um, we, we thought, OK, well, this is worth giving it a try. And then, of course, the wait list is 18 months because there aren't enough trainers. And Ellie, as you know, is 
one of four, and our second daughter is really the animal lover. Ellie had been bitten by a dog as a child, and so I often wondered, would this work for her? She, I would never describe her before Coach as an animal person, uh, and I worried that because Coach would be working for Ellie, he might not be part of our whole family. And the rest, you know, Anna, Caroline, and William, our younger three children, were desperate for a dog, and the idea of having a dog come home and not be able to be part of the family just wouldn't work. So fortunately, CARES was willing to answer at all of my hundreds of questions, and uh, the answers were all answers that seemed like we could make work. So we applied, and we waited, and every time the kid said, we really want a dog, I said, we're, we have one coming, just a matter of when. And uh, we got a little more time under our belt. Ellie moved her way through middle school. And about around January of 2013, we got a phone call saying, Coach is going to be ready in March. And honestly, before that, I didn't really think much about it. I sort of I had an answer for the kids every time they asked for the dog. And I still had all this skepticism about whether it would really work. But there was reason enough to hope that it was going to be OK. And we, it was worth a try. And I didn't think much of it. And then we got this phone call, and I'm thinking, oh, how, are we really ready for this? What's this going to mean for Ellie? Ellie's lived her whole life out loud with diabetes, but not being defined by it. She would never describe herself as a diabetic. She would tell you she's a theater kid who is a phenomenal, she loves school. That's the part I would tell you. She's a phenomenal student, and she happens to have diabetes. What's it going to be like when she's walking through the world with a giant yellow dog and a bright red vest? And how will that affect her? What is it going to mean for our family? Is this dog going to acclimate? Can we afford him? Uh, can, will, it, will it really work? And I was convinced it wouldn't really work, but he was really cute, and we would find a way to acclimate, and maybe it would, it would be a, a beneficial part of our journey. And then on a very snowy day in March, uh, Ellie and Craig, my husband Craig, uh, took a journey to Kansas to get Coach. He was ready at this point. By the time they met him for the first time, he had had 2,000 hours of training. He had been in the Ellsworth Correctional Facility for about a year of his life. So the way CARES works is um, they have puppies that get donated. And uh, the, the puppies come from bloodlines of dogs that have successfully been service animals before. And they go through a screening process and go to a foster family where, as puppies, they get socialized and they get housebroken. And then when they get to be about three and a half or four months, they go into this correctional facility and they start working with a trainer there. And when the trainer decides the dog has hit all these basic training uh, milestones, they then go back to CARES and CARES using scent detection. So they take swabs from the insides of people's mouths who are living with diabetes when they're out of range. So when they're experiencing a low blood sugar or a high blood sugar and they train the dog to, to alert when they detect that scent. And so all that advanced training happens at, at CARES. So by the time Ellie met Coach, he had already been on an airplane twice. Uh, he had been living in a correctional facility for the first year of his life. And uh, when they met that first time, and I'm, I'm, I'll let her describe it after, uh, it, was, it was really magic. And I, I was panicked at home because I was home with the other um, with our other three children, and I had a, a work obligation that meant I couldn't travel with Craig and Ellie and, and had to keep the other kids in school. And being separated from Ellie is really difficult because I test her blood sugars every night in the middle of the night at least twice because we've had situations where she's had a seizure because of a low blood sugar, and she's had unexplained low blood sugars in the middle of the night that she doesn't wake up from. So to have them be in Kansas and to have me not be there, even though my husband knows how to do this, was nerve wracking for me. So I fell asleep the first night they were away with my computer open on my lap. And I had sent Craig a text saying, please send me what her number is when you check her at 1 in the morning. 1 in the morning came and went, and I don't get a response. And I start to get panicked. And then I text him again and say, please, why aren't you responding to your text? And then I call and I can't get him to answer. And we had had enough near misses where I was almost at the point where I was going to call the lobby of the hotel and ask them to go knock on his door. And of course, he didn't remember the time difference. And so you know, an hour later, I get this fear flurry of messages. You're never going to believe it, but. 
That first night in the hotel room, Coach knocked a backpack off the table to wake them up uh, because Ellie had a low blood sugar. And they're telling me this through the, tech, through the phone and text messages, and I'm thinking, that is absurd. There's no way that worked. It's a small hotel room. Maybe it was an accident. It's a coincidence. Uh, but Ellie, in her voice, when I spoke to her the next day, was absolutely sure that, this, that he knew what he was doing, that he knew her blood sugar was low, and that he was making sure that somebody woke up in order for her to treat it. And that, of course, was before they had done any real training together, so he didn't have any signals that they had worked out for how he was going to tell her when she was low. And so the training continued. They graduated, and, and as a licensed service team, they came home. And I have to say, this was the moment I feared most, this idea that she was going to now be in the world with her dog, and how was that going to work for her socially? Uh, and I remember getting the phone call as they were preparing to come home from Kansas with coach in tow, knowing that he had graduated and they had graduated and they were a licensed service team and he was going to be now going to school with her. And she said, Mom, you have to call the principal and make sure they know we're coming. And I said, what do you mean you're coming? I thought, you know, he'll be at home and he'll be with you at nighttime, but you're not going to bring him to school. And she said, oh yeah, I'm bringing him everywhere. I'm bringing him to school and I'm bringing him to dance class and I'm bringing him to theater rehearsal and where I go, he's going to go. And I thought, okay, well, she's comfortable with this, but how is that really going to work? And, you know, what will that be like for her? Will she always be the girl with the dog? And how can she live with that? And she doesn't self-identify as a diabetic and how will she explain all that? And much to our amazement and uh, surprise, it, I didn't need to answer any of those questions because the love between them and what this relationship means to her was all the explanation that, that anybody needs. And I, I share this picture because, uh, I mean, literally, this was during a theater summer program where she would leave the house at 6.30 in the morning with Coach and return at about 7.30 at night and where he goes, she goes. And knowing that they have each other has created just an unbelievable sense of relief for me. To me, the most unbelievable surprise as, as I navigate and uh, have tried to figure out how this really is gonna work long-term for Ellie is that it has triangulated our dynamic in such a way that this is no longer about diabetes, right? She is empowered as coach's trainer to reward him when he does what he's supposed to do. So instead of me saying to her, when did you last test your blood sugar? And, and you seem like you might be high. And did you take enough insulin for that piece of pizza? Uh, now it's a matter of what is coach trying to tell me? And how do I interpret what it is he's telling me right now? And when he does what he's supposed to do, I need to make sure I reward him. And diabetes isn't even in the mix anymore. I mean, it's about their relationship and the bond they have and her role as his trainer. And that's been a gift that I never could have imagined and anticipated in all this. And I have to say, you know, <laughs> I, I share this because I was so worried about how it would be with her at school with him. And, you know, he's part of the team. You know, he has his own student ID. He's the equivalent of the school mascot. As Ellie says, you know, he's a friend magnet. He's a conversation starter. And he's allowed her to live out loud with diabetes in a way that we never could have imagined while keeping her safe. Uh, for me, as Ellie's mother, anticipating the start of college, you know, we started visiting schools this past month. And when she was first diagnosed, and night after night, I'd be lying awake waiting to test her blood sugar at 1 in the morning thinking, how are we ever going to do this? How is she going to live independently and have the life she's intended to have with the risks that come every day with type 1 diabetes? And now to know she's got Coach by her side who's helping her every day just provides the kind of reassurance I never imagined we could have. And I have to give you just a couple recent stories about Coach's alerting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ellie was experiencing a low blood sugar and she was late getting to school, getting to class, her English class. And he had been trying to alert her and she was a little disoriented because that's what often happens when you're low. And he was trying to get her attention and pulling on the leash and she's pulling him into the, trying to pull him into the classroom. And they walk by the nurse's office and he stops. 
and he takes his leash and he pulls back on his leash and tries to pull her into the nurse's office to get her to test her blood sugar. And sure enough, you know, her blood sugar was 65. So my, my joke to her is, why do you make him work so hard? <laughs> uh, but ultimately, it, those kinds of things happen every day. You know, people often say, how often does he alert you? And uh, because he's trained to alert when her blood sugar is below 80 or above uh, 200, he alerts her two or three times a day at least. Um, if he can't get her to wake up in the middle of the night because her blood sugar is low, he comes and finds me. And that was really the moment when I stopped being skeptical and started trusting him. It was about two weeks or so in after he and Ellie had come home from Kansas and it was about four in the morning and I'm not trusting him yet so I'm still getting up in the middle of the night and I'm testing her blood sugar at one in the morning. And she was in range at one in the morning and I went off to bed. And at four in the morning I feel this wet, you know, something on my cheek and I you know, was disoriented and I'm still not used to the fact that we have coach in the house. And so I sort of pushed him off and said, it's all right coach, I'm, you know, and he then put both paws on the bed and, and right on top of me. And so I disoriented and I got up and I thought, well, this can't, I mean, I just tested her at one, she was fine. And, you know, maybe he has to go out. So he, he wanted me to follow her, me, him up to her bedroom. So I, up I went and tested her blood sugar and sure enough, she was low again. Um, and I, those things happen often when you're living with diabetes with no explanation. And to know that she's got him and that I have him uh, by her side has just been an incredible sense of relief. So the clan is clearly very happy to have Coach in the mix. As Ellie has said from the very beginning, that bringing Coach home was the first time she felt like diabetes was actually giving something back to our whole family. Um, this was us celebrating his fourth birthday in October. Uh, and as you can see, Anna, Caroline, and William think the sun rises and sets over, over Coach. Um, and we are very proud to be here this week because our book just uh, came out in paperback on Tuesday. So it's been a very fun journey to get out, get out and share our story. We've been able to uh, help other families find their way to CARES and we've now got, because we've been sharing the story for a while, we've got families who now have their own dogs, uh, which has just been incredibly gratifying. And actually CNN just aired a piece about uh, our story and they went into the prison and got to talk to the inmates who do the training which was a gift for me because I had not been able to be part of that since uh, Ellie and Co Craig were the ones in Kansas and to hear the inmates describe what it was like to read the story and hear how our lives were so positively impacted by what they have been able to do for us it's just been an, an amazing gift so uh, we feel very fortunate and with that I'd love to open it up to questions and Ellie's here and happy to answer questions, too. So this is a question for Ellie. You're about to go to college, or you're looking into colleges. What are you looking forward to? What sorts of plans oh. excite you? And I have no idea yet. <laughs> I'm st still looking at schools and figuring out different programs. We just started, we just visited um, Emerson and Boston Conservatory. And I found out last week that I got into Carnegie Mellon's musical theater summer program. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm really excited about that, and Coach will be going with me. And which for, that's a six-week overnight program, which will be the first time she's ever been away from home for that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say that the combination of Coach and a continuous glucose monitor, which I can now see on my phone, <laughs> make me feel very reassured that this is going to be a good thing. <laughs> so. So I actually had another question. So when you mentioned the uh, training, the people who actually trained them in the uh, prisons, is there a way for the families to actually write to them? I mean, I had, I had an ACL transplant, right? Mm. So I was able to write the donors mm. anonymously, but that felt really a, an important act right. to do. Do they have a way of your being able to? Unfortunately yeah. not. We're, um, they're not allowed to maintain contact with the families of the people. No, but let's say anonymous, because for example, oh, the donors yes, yes. family have no idea who yes, I am. Yes. But we can write to them, but they're not allowed to write to us. Okay. So they're not allowed to reach us. But so they're, can... they're, they're, they do get the feedback. Mm -hmm. from, yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. That's great. And in fact, you want to share this, the interaction with Michael? Sure. Um, when I was in Kansas getting coach with my dad, we actually spent a few hours in the prison where our dogs were trained. 
and we walked into the room and all the inmates were sitting there with the dogs that they were currently training at the time and they all started tearing up because they were getting so emotional over seeing these dogs and seeing them with the people that they would be helping and I got to meet one of the two trainers that got to train coach and it was I was a little nervous at first because it was a little intimidating he was a very very large man (laughs) and um but he was so sweet and um got really touched that that um coach was helping someone like me and that he could be a part of of an organization like cares uh one of my daughters has been over the last six months um training service dogs Mm -hmm. she's between being a graduate student in animal behavior and going to vet school and so this is very interesting Uh i'm not a dog person i have had contact with a whole series of these dogs over the years over these last six months they're amazing so the but the process of training them so this is what Mm -hmm. she's been doing can you say more about how what uh, that particular program is one is there an infrastructure or pipeline for dogs like this and and to what extent um do they need to be specialized early on it it sounded like Mm -hmm. like uh, coach has had sort of a service dog background Mm -hmm. and then was trained in particular skills that are valuable here um say more about the the training because it's it's a huge project sure well we actually had the privilege of meeting the person who developed the training protocol for diabetes alert dogs he himself was a dog trainer for search and rescue and narcotic detection and he was also living with type 1 diabetes and what he discovered was that the dogs could pick up on the scent when he was low or high and so he developed a protocol that uh, is used now and was used to train coach The pipeline, part of why we wanted to share our story was that the single biggest barrier to getting more dogs more affordably available to families is the availability of trainers. So there are, uh, the puppies are not the problem, it's the number number of trainers who are able to train. And the way that CARES works, they don't don't breed dogs and let the puppies, uh, you know, wait. They, They only make sure, you know, they breed the dogs and the timing of the puppies being born coincides with when a trainer is available. So as soon as the puppy's born, they are uh, studied and, and evaluated to see, are these dogs going to be ready to do what they need to do? So some dogs don't make it through the training. Uh, in fact, we were joking that we want to be on the list for the dropout dogs because when Ellie and Coach go to college, we're going to need, we're going to need another dog in the house. Uh, so, and, and there are PTSD, seizure detection, diabetes alert. Um, the, the Karis doesn't do this, but there are also dogs now being trained in cancer detection. Uh, and so what Karis would explain is that based on what they see the dog's abilities, uh, you know, they would be uh, either funneled into diabetes alert or seizure detection or PTSD. Uh, they also are particular about which breeds get trained for what. So. Often you're, you're talking about German Shepherds for veterans especially who are, who are getting dogs for PTSD. And that's because the breed is such that uh, they're more intimidating and they, their job is to protect the perimeter of, of a veteran or somebody coping with PTSD. And in fact, there were multiple um, veterans in Ellie's class who were there for a dog uh, P- to help treat PTSD. Uh, they use labs and golden retrievers predominantly for seizure detection and diabetes alert, especially in young people, because they're in situations where the dogs have to be especially social. Uh, And, you know, they say it's about 2,000 hours, but Ellie works with Coach every day um, in in order to help him be successful. Do you want to share, like, the kinds of things you do every day to help? Um, He needs to stay very regimented, so he stays on a very specific schedule in terms of feeding and when I walk him and stuff like that. But... I also have to groom him once a week, and I take him on training walks just to make sure that he is up to date and still alert at all times of the day. Right. We had we had an interesting dilemma about that that summer where I showed you that photo where they were both asleep in the car. He was having trouble waking up in the middle of the night, and I there were a couple times where she was just below range when he should have been awake and alerting and he wasn't and I called the trainer and I said I don't, I don't know what's happening and she said well describe what's, what the day is like. 
I said, well, they leave the house at 6.30 and they're in the summer program all day and then he's getting home at 7.30 at night and we take him for his walk and she said, he's exhausted. <laughs> you know, he, 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 he's working overtime and he needs a break. Uh, so we have to build in uh, s specified sleep time where he can sleep and know she's okay and he's off, sort of off the clock, not working. Um, we also often get the question about play. You know, can he ever just be a dog or is he always working? And um, what we've learned is that you have to distinguish play as a reward. So he gets to play when he's done what he's supposed to do. And then you distinguish play from work by taking the vest off, taking the working collar off, and putting the play collar on. So you'll often see him outside, you know, if he's being rewarded with fetch or some kind of play, he's got, he doesn't have his vest on, he's got his play collar on. Um, but he also is really wired to work. So like, whenever they're separated for any reason, he's very unsettled because he, he's looking for a job to do. I remember the very first time they were separated, she, was, she went to the mall with friends and there was not room in the car for coach. And they had been together nonstop for four weeks. And, and the trainer said, you know, they're going to have to get comfortable not being together all the time because inevitably there will be times when they're not together. Uh, so she left the house crying. He left with, his, you know, he, she, as she's leaving, her, his nose is pressed against the glass. Uh, and then he was very agitated. And she said, well, he's looking for a job to do. Give him a job to do. So we put the laundry basket in the middle of the kitchen floor. And he would walk around the kids' bedrooms, pick up the stuffed animals, put him in the laundry basket, <laughs> get a reward. <laughs> um, so he is very much a working dog. He needs to work. Uh, and he needs to stay regimented. Uh, he goes to the bathroom on command. People often say, you know, how do you know if he's alerting versus just trying to tell you he needs to go out? Um, he doesn't tell you he needs to go out because he goes out when he is supposed to go out and he goes to the bathroom on command and, and not otherwise. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and early on you mentioned when you were first investigating uh, service dogs that it was, you, you were surprised at how unregulated it was. Now, in retrospect, do you have a, you know, do you think that there's a, a need for more? Would yes. that be helpful? Uh, what, yes. What's your sense of the, what could be done that would be useful there? Yeah, I have to say, um, diabetes alert dogs are still very unusual. There aren't that many. Uh, CARES, which has been in operation for 10 years, has only trained 1,300 dogs total, and not just for diabetes alert. It's a, an, a new and emerging area and I think we need better research that actually demonstrates the effect these animals can have, not just from a biometric standpoint, because actually Ellie's A1C is better now than it was when he, um, before we had Coach. So we could tell you that she actually is in range more often and her body is healthier than it was without him. But we need that quantified in the form of, of research that's not just anecdotal. Uh, but beyond that, I think the industry itself is very poorly regulated. You know, we, um, I, we've met too many families who have spent an inordinate amount of money, I mean tens of thousands of dollars, have raised money through philanthropic efforts to get a dog, and the dog comes and doesn't work. Um, so, you know, there, there needs to be a national accreditation process that is the standard. Uh, CARES works with one and, and abides by it very carefully, uh, but there are others that don't. And ultimately, I, you know, right now, coaches, um, Coach and Ellie are protected through the ADA because they're a trained service team and he has a demonstrated uh, job. But how many of you have been on an airplane with a service dog, right? Um, so there's also this, um, it's a very gray area and we need, we need to tighten it up because it will help the people who really are in need of a service dog and it will help the families who are, are trying to navigate their way through this process and have some assurance. I mean, I could, Karis has said to me, they've heard from, they hear from families all the time who spent $25,000 and got a dog that didn't work. Um, and it's, you know, that's just not right. Uh, this is a question for Ellie. Mm -hmm. um, since you started at school, have you found, how have you found that your know, school environment or maybe even just the way your friends think about these kind of types of issues have changed? Because you've been living with it, but have you seen changes come about in your school or, you know, your friends are more interested in talking about medical research? Um, not necessarily. He, like my mom said before, I don't really classify myself as a diabetic, so it's not something I talk about very often. It's just sort of a part of my daily life. So when I got coach, especially as a freshman, going into this very large school and trying to navigate social aspects of high school, um, that was hard because I was... I felt at the beginning, 
before I even got coached that he might be putting a label on me as a, or just a label that something might be wrong with me. And, but then I got to school and he, they loved him. He really became a part of the school community and everyone welcomed him with open arms. My, my freshman English class, they had tennis balls on the bottom of our chairs and he would always try to bite them off. <laughs> So the next day, my English teacher brought in a bucket of old tennis balls for him to chew on during class. And um, she wasn't supposed to do, by the way. <laughs> it was a reward. I know. I know. <laughs> um, but he's really become a part of the school community. But in terms of, of diabetes being a, a conversation topic, I don't think that has changed as much. Um, but I'm willing to talk about it with anyone who has questions about it. You know, what, what we have discovered is that without coach, the topic of diabetes is very heavy, right? Because you're trying to explain the reality of what it's like to live with a chronic disease and, and what it means when, that you can't go to sleep and trust that you're safe through the night. Uh, but with coach, it allows us to have conversations with people who are really fascinated by how coach works and what he does for Ellie that open the door to information and education about what it's like to live with diabetes. And I think that's been very empowering. And part of the reason we shared the story, we, we really wrestled with, do we want to write this book? Do we really want to tell the story? And I remember a conversation Ellie and I had, because I, I felt like it was up to her to decide. I was willing to do the work if she was willing to put herself out there. And you know, you, you answer so many questions about, well, is it what you ate that caused your diabetes? Is it, you know, because you didn't exercise enough, there, the confusion between type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, and um, lots of people have asked her if she's just training coach or you know, wave their hands in front of her face to see if she needs a, if he's a seeing eye dog. I mean, so for all those reasons, she, she wanted to share the story. And I think it's been very empowering in that way because it allows us to, to open up about life before coach and the risks that Ellie lives with every day with coach in a way that I think without him is a much harder conversation to have. So that's been wonderful. And then just one quick follow up. How has he taken to music and theater? Does he have any kind of express any preference <laughs> yes. or he just has to wait quietly backstage? He loves it. <laughs> he likes it more. My younger sister plays volleyball and my brother plays baseball and soccer and he hates the noises at the game but he loves coming to rehearsal. And the, within a year of me getting him, I was doing a summer program and they actually wrote a part for him in the show and he had his own little dressing room backstage. <laughs> it was really cute. Yeah, and he, he was, they were both in Of Mice and Men with Boston Children's Theater down here and that was the worst, that was the worst for me because they both got killed in, in the play. I said, okay, no more. Coach, Coach and Ellie can't have something bad happen in the, in the play. Uh, but it's been, it's been amazing. And as Ellie said, I think he must have had whistle training at some point because mm -hmm. he cannot handle, I mean, he just does not like being in the gym cheering on Anna with the referee whistles. It drives him crazy. Um, we actually had, and I'll share this, this is a very uh, present and pressing uh, story for me. Ellie just opened a show uh, a few weeks ago and we haven't figured out how to handle performance nights with Coach because there's no way to keep him safe backstage and allow him to do his job uh, because he would have to be crated and then he'd have to bark in order to alert and so he'd be barking in the show and it, you know, we've, we tried a few different things and it just doesn't work. Um, so opening night, she was running the show in rehearsal before the, before the actual opening and didn't have Coach with her had had too much insulin for the amount of dancing and activity she was doing in the show and not enough food before the show with nerves. And her continuous glucose monitor was alarming her on her phone, but she couldn't hear it because she was on the stage with the music playing. Luckily, it was alarming me on my phone at work. And I was incessantly trying to reach her, couldn't reach her because she's on the stage, was able to find someone in the box office to go into the theater to pull her off the stage. And it took us about two hours of treating the low to get her into a healthy range so she could perform. Uh, and I use that as an example because it you know, just happened a few weeks ago. And the juxtaposition of what that would have looked like with Coach. So if that had happened in a rehearsal and Coach was in the theater in rehearsal, he just would have walked onto the stage and made her stop um, and made her very aware of what was happening. And that's, you know, that's the value of having him around, why we feel so lucky. One more question, any more? 
Well, this has been such a gift. I can't thank you enough for the chance to share our story, and we look forward to coming back at a later time. <laughs>